Good morning, everyone. Oh, good. The microphone's working. So, as I said, I work at Autodesk. Autodesk is a huge company. It's like 10,000 people. We have hundreds of products, but the part of Autodesk I work in is the Entertainment Creation Products Division, and we're the part of Autodesk that makes tools for animators, uh, people who do computer animation, special effects for movies, uh, TV shows, you know, simulation, anything like that. And these are some pictures by artists who use our software that they've published on our forums. So we make software, but it's our customers who make magic with it. And I love working in this field. I just love the creativity and getting to help create tools for these people. Um, as I said, I'm the director of experience design right now, but in my past, I've been a software engineer. I've been a UX designer. My own background is in design and software engineering. Um, and I've been an agile coach. And this will tell you a little bit of the story of how we um, came up with the idea of dual track agile and how that can help you adapt your UX practice or in fact adapt anything else to work in an agile environment. So this is what I'll be talking about today. Um, and I want to ask, how many of you have seen that diagram before? I've seen that, I'm curious. Okay, yeah, a good number. Uh, so I, I know which of you are process wonks now. Um, that's from a 2007, uh, sorry, 2000 and, yeah, seven article that we wrote, uh, marked by Marsha, who still works on my team. Um, but I'm going to start off by talking about how Agile ruined experience design. Now, for those of you who are younger than me, which is probably most of you, um, back in the 1990s, uh, when I started, well, I started working in the 80s, but it, all through the 90s, I was working at a company called Alias, and we were doing the same kind of work. We were designing um, software for computer animation, and we worked in a waterfall development practice, like pretty much the entire industry. I worked for a woman named Lynn Miller, and Lynn and myself and my colleague Desiree uh, were sort of this all-unicorn UX team. And by unicorns, I mean we did everything. We did our own research, we did our own um, design, and we did our own usability testing and validation. That's the way we liked it. We didn't do graphic design. We hired Marsha for that. Um, but we had a great practice. We had great rapport with the developers. We were doing everything right. Everything was working beautifully. And then, in 2001, the Agile Manifesto happened. Um, you should all have seen this page. Actually, this page hasn't changed since 2001. Same graphic. Um, but Agile came along. This idea started, and my company were really early adopters. So one of the signatories of the Agile Manifesto, Jim Highsmith, there was brought to our company the year after, in 2002, and he trained all of our developers. He trained all of us. We all got into a room, and he did two days of training. And Jim is a great trainer. He's really smart. I think he's still doing it. Um, he totally revolutionized our software practice. But when he was describing how Agile works and the whole way it goes, UX didn't exist in it. There was no mention of UX. So they'd say, like, you know, how do you know the thing's good? Well, we, you do a cycle, and at the end of the cycle, they said before Sprint, so at the end of the cycle, you would show your software um, to the customer and say, is this good? And if your customer says, yes, this is good, then you're done. And of course, those of us who work in UX are like, this is terrible. You don't get any insight. You can't tell anything about learnability. You can't tell anything about usability. Um, it's just a really bad way of doing things. So I got into a big discussion with Jim, but that's another thing. Anyway, so we adopted Agile, and our engineers were happy. Our practice worked really well. You know, a few bumps along the way, but it was great for our engineering team. They loved it. They, they suddenly they were in control. They used to kind of be controlled from above. Now they were driving the train, and they could make things happen um, the way they were. But that was the engineering team. The design team, we had had a really good life, and suddenly we were at ends. We couldn't fit in the process anymore. We would do things like, you know, we would do a study, usability study, but by the time we were done, development would be three phases off. Or we'd be designing something, and they'd have changed direction in one of their agile sprints. We couldn't give them feedback when they needed it, and we kind of got disconnected. It was horrible. Um, and the funny thing is we were going to other design conferences and seeing the same problem among other people. And these are some quotes that people from other companies said to me. I wrote them down at the time because I thought they were kind of funny. Um, that they, they think, well, I'm just going to keep doing things the way I've always done them, and they'll come back begging to me um, <laughs> from someone whom I assume has never met a developer. Anyway, so this led us to our first revelation of the three revelations I'm going to talk about today. And our first revelation was that to serve Agile, design had to become Agile. And we thought about what that meant. So I went back to the Agile principle, well, not me, me and Desiree and Lynn, the three of us always worked together. Um, went back to the principles of Agile. We looked at the things in the manifesto. And we thought about what it is that makes Agile work. And what's really happening in Agile 
is you have this loop. You've all seen this a thousand times, the build, measure, learn loop. And you've brought this into development. But this is a basic idea in, in usability, um, that you know, usability testing and that is, has this loop. So we should be compatible. Why aren't we compatible if we have the same kind of loop? So we had to look a bit more into agile practices and what makes them agile. And here's a couple of, there's different attributes, but here's a few I've picked out that makes agile practices actually agile. They're more conversational, right? They're more about talking to people than writing documents. They're collaborative, you're working together. But incremental and iterative is super important. An agile process is something you should be able to do over and over again, continuously. You don't do a big, big, like, scary thing at the end of your release cycle and then everyone collapses. You know, you should be able to steadily go along and produce stuff and incrementally add value. Um, and of course, things are time boxed. You're working for a specific amount of time on a specific thing, and then you stop. And everyone's working together. And we realize this is part of our problem, because as designers, we're not working on the same thing the developers are working on at the same time. We're supposed to be in front of the train. We're laying track. We're clearing bushes, making way for the train to go. And we're supposed to be behind the train, validating things, that, you know, making sure everything went the way it was supposed to go. So this is the kind of time box we needed. We needed to be desynchronized from development. And this brought us to the dual track model, which we developed on Lynn's whiteboard back about 2003. So here's the basic idea. At the beginning of a project, you're in your sprint zero. And at this time, you know, you're working out, figuring out what you're gonna do, you're chartering. And you'd look for, at this point, what you look for is code that needs to be written that doesn't have any UI attached to it. Because there's always something. There's always something in the back end or some technical debt that the developers can work on that doesn't need UI um, help. And then once you finish your sprint zero, your work divides into two different tracks, a designer track and a development track. So in the first sprint, the developers are doing that stuff you've identified, stuff that didn't need design work. No problem. And while they're doing that, design has a bit of time to look ahead. What's the next thing? And the designers can get, be getting it ready. They can be validating it, making designs, usability testing for paper prototypes. And at the end of the sprint, they can pass off anything that's been validated can be passed back to development to work on in the next sprint. So design is always working one or two sprints ahead. They can also start researching for further forward stuff. So the design team can be saying, oh, well, you know, we see a few more things that are coming down the pipe, so we can start researching that. And you can just repeat this cycle over and over again. In sprint two, we're working on sprint three stuff, but we're also validating what went into the code in sprint one. I, I think this whole slide thing is gonna be on SlideShare afterwards too, so um, you should be able to get that. That's the model that we came up with about 2003. Um, but the one thing that wasn't really in our first diagram that Marsha did for us was this, is because we get, left people with a false impression that we were handing things off between sprints, and that's not really true. There's constant communication that has to go on um, all the time. So I want to be really clear about this because this model, the dual track agile model, has been written about all over the place. If, if, you, if you Google it, you'll find dozens of articles about it by different people, and a lot of people get the same things wrong when they talk about it. So number one, be really clear, it's not two teams, it's two tracks, the same team is doing two different tracks of work which are tracked differently. And that, that, that is really important um, because we made a whole lot of mistakes when we, we, we started out. Uh, for example, one of the things, the first adaptations we tried was we would just put design work in the backlog and treat it like development work, but that doesn't work in Agile. It violates the Agile principle of working software is the only measure of success, and it screws up your velocity and your calculations. We tried doing um, complete designs. We would design the whole thing, and at the end of every sprint, we would redesign for the end product over and over again, and that killed our, our designers. They just got so far behind. But anyway, sorry, back to this. So things people get wrong, number one. So devs and designers are on the same team, that is correct. Insight is shared, we're not throwing design over the wall, we're not saying we've done the design now, we're throwing it to development. That's not how it works, we work together on it. Developers have to be involved in design because they're the ones who can determine the feasibility of building it. The designers can say we want to do X, so developers have to be involved. Similarly, while the developers are building the actual features, designers need to be involved because the developers are going to learn things. Oh, that code's too hard, the API doesn't support that, and there have to be modifications. 
So everyone's working together, one team, but doing two different tracks of work. Okay, that wasn't quite enough, though, because we had to change the way we did our UX practice. And if you go back to that list of agile practices have these, iter these attributes, and you can find that you can pretty much adapt any practice to be agile by making sure it's that way. And I'll give you an example of how we did it. So take, for example, usability testing. This is the way people did usability testing, and maybe some of you still do it that way. You wait until you have something to test, and then you create, you know, you create your prototype, and you plan a test, your protocol, and you recruit users, and you bring them in, and you run the test, and then you write this big-ass report at the end that lists 100 things that went wrong, and you hand it back, and you've taken three weeks to do it. That's not agile. It doesn't, it's not time boxed, you know how long it's going to take. You, you can do it iteratively. Um, is it collaborative? Is it conversational? Is it just in time? It doesn't really fit all that well, especially time boxed. So what we did is we changed our practice. Instead of waiting until we had something to test, we planned the tests first. We said, every two weeks, we're going to have a usability test. We don't know what we're going to test. We built a pool of users that our recruiter could just pull from that pool of about 40 people. They'd pull five people in every two weeks that we could test with. And when the test came up, we had, well, what do we have? We've got this paper prototype from the designers. We've got this bit of code that just went in from the developers. And we would um, just test whatever was ready. And we'd invite the team to watch so that people, everyone could see. So we'd effectively just done this. We've now made this practice hit all of these agile attributes. The other thing is that at the end of it, we'd say, OK, here's the three issues we're going to fix. Maybe we have a list of 30 issues, but there is no point in writing a big report with 30 issues, because the fact is, when you fix the top three or five things, which is all you'll have time for in the next sprint, it's going to change people's behavior, and the rest of the issues may disappear, or new ones will show up and be more important. So you don't really need the rest of the list. You're going to have some completist designer who can't not write it down, so let them write it down. But it's not what you need to report. Look at the way we used to do um, user research. User research in Waterfall, you go in at the beginning of a project and you'd talk to you know, hundreds of users, and you'd interview them, and you'd build all of these artifacts, these big test reports and personas and reports and use cases and whatever else. I don't think we were doing journey maps back then. And you'd deliver that to the team. That would be take like three months before you'd start building anything. Um, and that, of course, is not agile at all. That you're making a bet there on the next two years of development, and that's just not a good way to work. Um, so to be agile, we had to find a way to make this iterative and incremental. So we talked to users regularly in different ways at our usability testing that was regularly scheduled. We'd go visit people, and we'd kind of focus on what was the next thing we needed, what's the next piece of information. But we're also always updating our big documents. We have a persona document, and you can update it as you learn more, as you gain insight. You know, we can update our, our journey maps or whatever it is we're building. So the idea is those artifacts are, stay around, but they're living documents that you're always touching and, and redoing. And continuously, as you're visiting customers or as you're uh, gathering more research, um, you want to conversationally in your scrums, in your daily scrums, say, hey, we talked to some people and we got this new insight. So that insights are shared throughout the team as well. Um, we have all different ways of touch, touching users, and we're not afraid to mix methods. So sometimes, if we have someone in for a usability test, at the end of it, we'll say, hey, we want to interview you for some upcoming stuff. Or can we run the usability test at your place, and while we're there, we're going to do some contextual inquiry. Like, we just put everything together, and we cut it into little bite-sized pieces that's focused on our immediate needs coming up. Design specs. I used to write, those of you who came from the, uh, from the waterfall world may remember the 60-page design spec with every detail written down. And there's this law I realized that the longer your design spec, the less likely a developer was to actually read it. So the way we do designs now typically is just a couple of pages, pictures, call-outs, and a conversation, where you sit down with people and you talk through the design. It takes so much less time, and it is so much more effective. And of course, it's agile. So we had that. We figured out how to adapt our process. We figured out how to time it all. And we got it working. It worked for our team. 2003, we got this stuff going down. And we started to publish on it. This is Lynn and Desiree and I in 2006. Um, Lynn did a paper. Actually, it was funny. She wrote a paper for uh, UPA 2004, I think. 
uh, on this whole topic, and the paper was rejected by the conference because they said, and I quote, Agile is a niche thing of, of interest to few people. Um, so she ended up presenting it at Agile 2005. I did a paper on some of our adaptations at UPA uh, 2006. And in 2007, Desiree put together all of our work and wrote an article for the Journal of Usability Studies, which for, I think, the next five or six years at least was the most cited article in the journal ever. So that's when this started to get spread around a lot. But we weren't the only people working on this. I don't want to take credit for that. A lot of people were working on this problem at the same time and coming to kind of similar uh, conclusions. Now, one thing we didn't do and we should have done is we should have come up with a great name for our method. We did not. We were calling it Parallel Tracks. But because we didn't have a really good name, we found other people writing about it and calling it something else. So you may hear this referred to as Staggered Sprints or Dual Track, which is what I'm calling it today. Um, but it's all the same thing. But anyway, we finished this, and suddenly we learned that we love Agile. When Agile arrived at Alias, I hated it. Oh, I hated it so much. But we learned to really love it. We loved working this way. Um, and our experience wasn't alone. This uh, Jeff Patton, who you may know as the story mapping guy, uh, this is a quote from him. He had the same experience when Agile was really bad. He interviewed us back then uh, to see how we had been fixing that. And, um, but again, we love it. But then, in 2006, my company was acquired by Autodesk. And at that time, Autodesk was not Agile, and they crushed our Agile development practice. Just like, nope, back to Waterfall, back to those 60-page design documents. Um, and I got to say, you don't realize how good you have it in an Agile development environment until you lose it, and you go back, and oh, it was just awful. It was, I felt like I was running at like one-third speed, slow-mo. Um, but luckily, Autodesk was catching up with the rest of the industry, and they decided to go Agile as well. And because I was complaining a lot, I was put in charge of the Agile transformation for our division. I was the lead Agile coach um, for that transformation. I made lots of mistakes, which I'll tell you some of. But one of the things I realized when we were doing this, and it came to my second revelation, is that there's always friction between the parts of the company that are Agile and parts of the company that aren't Agile. So, for example, when we went, development went Agile, we, I described to you the kind of friction that design was having with them at the time. But frankly, there was friction with every other part of the company, too. Because marketing would say, well, we need to know what features you're putting in by the end of the year so we can write, before we do the big release, so we can write marketing materials. And, you know, the same thing, the documentation people were like, you have to freeze the UI four months beforehand so we can write all the documentation. And the localization people were, we have to translate this, so you need to freeze everything. But the development team was saying, well, we're working agile. We don't know what features are going to be in. We're changing direction. We're learning as we go along. And that caused a huge amount of friction and, and fighting. Now, of course, once we got dual track working, we were able to move ourselves over. And suddenly, we no longer had friction with development. But we were having friction with everyone else as well. Which takes us to 2011 and the publication of The Lean Startup. Now, I hadn't heard of this book. Desiree, uh, my colleague, says, John, John, you've got to read The Lean Startup. And I said, what is it? And she goes, it's agile for product management. And that's really what it is, because if you look at The Lean Startup, which is, of course, a way of doing business discovery and figuring out how to build a new, um, a new idea, product, or service, but it does it in a way that hits all of these agile attributes. It does it time-boxed experiments with hypotheses, incrementally, collaboratively. Like, it's agile for, for product management. So that allowed us then, you know, product management could move to the other side of the friction boundary. And, and that's kind of where we want to be now with these three things going on. That's what this conference is about. Um, as it turns out, there are ways of moving everyone over here. Uh, and that right now, we actually have our localization team can work agile with incremental um, translation. And we've worked out other ways of doing this stuff. So since we came up with this process and it's been spread around, there's been a lot of improvements, of course, uh, that people have done. Uh, originally, we called this we call them the interaction design track and the development track. Um, but somebody, we think it's David Hussman, came up with the name discovery track and delivery track. And I think that's way better. You have one track of work, which is you're trying to discover what it is you need to do, and the other track where you're actually building and delivering it. I think that is a way better way of thinking about it. Marty Kagan made this generalized model of it, which he's published. And again, this isn't a particular methodology, it's just a model that sort of fits a lot of different uh, things like this. And he's very, he points out something really important, which I didn't mention, is that 
Not everything makes it from the first track to the second track. Part of discovery is learning what you shouldn't do. And, um, you know, that, that's, that's a key thing as well. Um, Carol Smith, Thera Roach, and uh, Hannah Moyers just did a paper this year uh, expanding dual track into triple track. They're postulating that you should have another track, which is just research, which sort of does knowledge stuff that feeds into the problem-solving track, which then leads to the actual delivery track. Um, it's an interesting paper. I'm not sure I would, I would do it this way, but uh, Carol and Thera are super smart. I don't know Hannah, personally. Um, but probably worth looking at. Uh, and Jeff Gothelf just today actually tweeted a high-res version of his model that, uh, that matches UX and Agile, his way of seeing it, which is a variation on that um, going on. I don't have a slide of that because he just tweeted it today, but if you follow Jeff Gothelf, you can look at that. And I was looking at, the, of course, the UXDX model. I pulled this up, and I was considering what you have here is, again, the same build, measure, learn loop, but you have it for product, you have it for development, and you have it for um, deployment. We work in a package software thing, so we don't have deployment the same way those of you who have web services do. Uh, but it's, it's the same build, measure, learn loop, and it's all synchronized. So it's sort of the same idea kind of brought out to a larger scale. Uh, my chief architect saw this, um, saw this image and said, leave it to an Irish design conference to have a shamrock-shaped model. <laughs> but before I finish up here, I want to talk about my last revelation, and this has to do with when we deployed it. When I was the chief uh, Agile coach for the division, the way we chose to do this is we said, okay, we're going to come up with a process, we're going to teach everyone the process and impose it on the whole division. Bang! And what we learned is, for some teams, it worked beautifully. Some teams like ran with Agile, they did great. And other teams, they, they just seemed to hit the walls and it didn't work well. And, that, and I had to really come to understand that. So that was basically a mistake I made, or not we made. Um, I'll take my, my part of the blame for it. Um, but what I learned out of that is just this, our third revelation is that you can have a good process, but culture eats process for breakfast. If you try and put a process where the culture doesn't match, culture wins every time. You can't fix culture with process. So you have to kind of, um, you kind of have to do that. So I can just end with a few points, which I think are useful on that one. So I think the right way to do this um, is process, practice grows in fertile soil. You want to find a place where people want to pick up a new practice. Imposing a practice from outside can cause a reaction where people don't want to, you know, don't tell me what to do. I want to work the way I'm used to working. Uh, so you need to find someone who's keen on doing it. And instead of imposing it, you want to find people who are, are, are change agents, people who will champion a new pro process. You want, like, you want to find a team of people who, you want to work agile, you want to work this way, let's do it, and you let them be successful with it, and then other teams will want to copy them. So it's the, it's the find champions, then clone this out. Um, beware of heroes. Agile is fundamentally an anti-heroic thing. The team is the hero. People work together. If you have that one person, <clears throat> especially the one person who draws a lot of their social standing from being a hero on the team, <clears throat> you know, oh, Bill worked really late and wrote this magic code and that, um, that can be poisonous for an Agile, agile team, honestly. It's, uh, it has to really be teamwork. It has to be collaborative. If, if someone is used to getting their social standing that way, they may deliberately undermine the process or undermine processes like that. And that's what you don't want to happen. You want people to draw their strength from the team. So you always have to be careful. Anytime you're imposing a new process, you're changing the power balance. And that can be threatening to some people. Uh, if a team is, if um, I've, I've seen teams that are like, have a strong uh, development background where developers always had all the power and everyone else was serving them. There are other places I've talked to where it's the other way around, where design is driving everything <clears throat> and developers are just there to write whatever the designers come up with. And both of those things are unhealthy. You need a balance of, of inputs on the team to come up with the best decisions and make the best choices. You have to watch your incentives. A lot of companies incentivize uh, one-off work or individual's work rather than teamwork. And, and you can actually, again, undermine teamwork if people are like, oh, we, you know, there's so much of a bonus and we're dividing it between members of the team, then why would I help my team succeed if I can make myself look good? So your incentives have to line up with everything you, know, you want to line up. Um, and inclusion is super important in any of this stuff. The reason 
these things work well, these processes where product and development and design work together, is because all three of those groups bring a different perspective. And a lot of people don't understand diversity and inclusion. A lot of people think it's, oh yeah, that just means we have different cultures and not all at the same table, you know. And that's not the point of it. The point of it is about making better decisions for your business. And there's a lot of research about this. And here's the thing. So if you bring different people with different perspectives and different knowledge into a room and you sit them down and you get them talking together, um, naturally human beings will gravitate towards talking about the knowledge that everyone has in common. And that turns out that's not very useful because everyone has the knowledge that they have in common. That doesn't help you make better decisions. So inclusion is about practices you can do to make sure that diverse people, that diverse opinions get heard. And it turns out the research shows a few things that make this work. <clears throat> Number one is, that, well, there's different meeting practices that get people to share their opinions individually before, um, before a group discussion starts. So you can do things like get people to write their thoughts down on post-it notes so everything gets posted. And that will get the different opinions out. But it also turns out there's necessary conditions. One of the conditions is that everyone in the room has to respect that other people have information that they don't have. And if you come from a culture, again, where somebody thinks, oh, product management knows everything, then they don't respect the opinions of others, then your diversity will have no effect. If you come from a culture where everyone's like, I know my bit, but I understand that designers know things I don't know, developers know things I don't know, and you all work to get that unknown stuff on the table, then you will have good decisions. And that's the difference. Diversity is having the right people in the room. Inclusion is your practices so that they can all contribute fully. And that will lead you to better business outcomes. And my last point is to choose your scum, scrum masters wisely. Because we've had problems before where people, at the beginning usually when your people are doing an agile practice, they don't want to have full-time scrum masters. So they'll make, you know, the development manager will be the scrum master or whatever. But the scrum masters are the ones who own the heart of the process. And they're the ones who have to care about all this stuff. So that's the important thing. When you are choosing scrum masters for your team, choose people who really, really care about making it work. Who are the scrum masters out there? Like, you guys are heroes if you're doing it right. Um, and that's all I have to share with you today. Again, that's me, and I'm happy to take questions. I think we have a few minutes left.